A very, very warm welcome to you all today. Uh, my name is Claire Martin, and I work for St. Ethelberga Centre for Reconciliation and Peace. Um, so, yeah, welcome to this uh, webinar on Racism in the UK, Two Perspectives, with Judy Wright and Anaya Falar-Limon. And I think this conversation is, is going to be a really rare and kind of special opportunity to hear different perspectives on the topic of racism uh, in a conversation that's not about debating or winning an argument. It's about having a dialogue and learning from one another. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about the format of the event. Um, to begin with, each of our speakers is going to present for about 15 minutes their response to the question, how should we respond to racism in the UK today? Then after that, there will be a chance for each of the speakers to ask the other speaker a question. Then we'll be opening things up for an audience Q&A. And I think there may be a link in the chat box now, or there will be one coming up very soon to pigeonhole. Uh, so if you have a question, if a question comes up for you as you're listening, please pop over to the pigeonhole, pop your question in the pigeonhole. And there's also an opportunity that you can vote on which questions you're especially interested to hear uh, our speakers respond to. And then at the end of the session, we're gonna come back to each one of our speakers and hear from them how this conversation has landed for them, what they're taking away from it. Um, so that's, that's the format. Um, and now I'd like to really warmly welcome our speakers and just tell you a little bit about them. So uh, Judy Ride is a psychotherapist who has studied what it means to be white within a racial context. She's the director and supervisor of Trauma Foundation Southwest, which provides counseling and psychotherapy for refugees and asylum seekers. Her first book was Being White in the Helping Professions. And her more recent book was White Privilege Unmasked, How to Be Part of the Solution. Um, and this book looks at the dynamics of white privilege as they play out in society more broadly. Inaya Falaran Imam is a writer, a social and political commentator and campaigner. She's the founder and director of the Equiono Project, a discussion and ideas forum which promotes universal humanist values on issues of race, culture and politics. Inaya was uh, on the board of directors of the Free Speech Union, and she's a columnist for Spiked Magazine. And recently she launched Free Speech Champions, which is a new initiative to encourage free speech, especially amongst the younger generation. So with that, I'd like to give a very, very warm welcome to both of our speakers and to hand over to Judy Ride, who's going to start us off. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so, before saying something about <clears throat> how we might respond to racism in today's society, I want to say something about how I came to write the books I did about being white. Um, and how, you know, how some, so I can go on to say more about how white people can respond to racism in today's society. Um, when I started doing my research at Bath University, which I did before writing the books. Um, I went there because I could see how um, the psychotherapy profession of which I was a member was very undiverse. And I was quite determined to do something about that. Um, it's been a very long uh, journey and certainly not one that's um, made a lot of difference, <clears throat> although there, it is more diverse now than it used to be. <clears throat> um, but when I started my research, I had an underlying assumption that I didn't realize I had. It wasn't, I didn't articulate it and I didn't think about it. But when I started my research, I began to realize that I had an underlying assumption um, that uh, race was something that other people had, that I did not have a race, 
but other people had a race. Um, that white people were unraced. And I started reading around the subject and found that this had been noticed before <laughs> um, by people uh, studying white studies. Um, and that is that um, white people tended to think of themselves as just normal. We're the normal people and other people deviate from that normality in terms of race. Um, and so what sort of comes out of that assumption is that white people tend to feel that black people should help them how not to be racist. Um, that black people are the people who are uh, experts on race. Um, and we should go to them to discover things about that. And in, in this journey I've made, which is over 30 odd years, um, I've had various wake up calls and one of them was from someone called Farad Dalal, who um, is um, uh, an Indian or, or India, I think he, is he British? Anyway, originally from India, um, who um, is a group analyst and psychotherapist who works with groups. And um, the organization I worked with asked him to come and give us a talk about racism and about racism in psychotherapy. Um, and um, he gave a talk, which is very good. But then he said, look, I don't know why you just asked me to come and talk about this. I am an expert in all sorts of things. Um, but there's always this assumption that the black person is the person who's the expert on race. And um, that really, that was one, that was a real wake up call. Um, and I tried to um, not come from that place after that. Um, so hopefully we might have moved on a bit from then. The idea that white people are just normal. You'd think maybe in all those years, maybe white people have moved on from that. Um, Interestingly, I did a talk yesterday with a group of white people. And when I mentioned this about being just normal, um, a lot of people said afterwards that that had really hit home, that they realized that they felt they were just normal and not raced. So it's still there. It's still something that's underlying white people, underlying white people's ideas of themselves in today, today's society. So it follows that black people were the ones with the problem. Um, and maybe I could help by not being prejudiced, but the, the view from seeing it as white people as normal is that black people are the ones with the problem. Um, <clears throat> so when I started doing my research, I was part of a, a small research group. And I was told then by this re research group that really I was, um, researching the wrong thing, that actually it was none of my business, that it was that race was black people's business and I was trying to be a bit of a lady bountiful by trying to address it, um, which was a bit, you know, took me back a bit. <coughs> so, <coughs> but then I thought about it and thought, well, race is something for all of society, so surely it is something for white people as well. Maybe it's something that white people should look at about themselves, what it is being white in, in a, a racial society. So that's how I came to uh, focus on whiteness. Um, but being white people thinking they're normal is built on centuries of white people thinking themselves as superior. Um, maybe white people still think of themselves as superior, but it was certainly much more overt several, you know, hundreds, a couple of hundred years ago, or even a hundred years ago. Um, but, so it was thought of as quite okay for Europeans to go into um, like Africa, America, Canada, and simply take over the continent because the people that lived there they saw as inferior, as they could just be cleared out of the way. Um, almost that the first people to arrive in these continents were actually white because they didn't really see the people who were already there 
as people. Um, and this wasn't certainly, it took many years, many decades and hundreds of years for people to actually see there was anything the matter with this. Obviously, now we have got to the point of um, having anti-discrimination laws. Um, so it's acknowledged that um, by society that racism is wrong, um, you know, enough that we can have laws against um, uh, discrimination and grounds of race. Um, but so does this put an end to the question? Is racism just at the margins of society with the ultra right wing um, and um, wanting to protect our borders? But I think we've, a lot of people were very dismayed by the Brexit debate and final vote that so many people um, felt that they wanted to protect our borders. Um, and that's been a bit of a wake up call. Um, and so why is it that Rene, Rene, Rene Edo Lodge won't talk to white people about race now? You know her book, why, um, why I no longer talk to white people about race. Um, and and I, you know, I think it's just, it's that white people don't get it about race and the problems with race. Um, and I, I want to put a question to you. How many times a day do you think that black or brown people think about race? And how many times a day do you, if you're, you know, if you're black or brown, how many times do you think about race? If you're white, how many times do you think about race? I'd be really interested if you would like to put in the chat box, you could put um, white and then a number <laughs> or, not white and a number. And it'd be interesting to see um, what your answer is to that. Um, you don't have to say who you are, so you can be honest. Um, um, but in terms of racial thoughts, um, one, th one of the things I found in my re research, both in myself and in sort of co-researchers of people who I was partnering with to do this research, we found that there tended to be racial thoughts, racist thoughts at the edge of our minds that we might not actually focus on and realize we're having. But if you do focus on, you find that you do have. And um, so I've, after this time, you know, when I've been doing workshops and so on, I've asked people to try to catch those thoughts. Um, and it's been quite interesting to find out that actually it's quite common amongst white people to have racist thoughts that they don't actually listen to and don't kind of put out of their minds, don't focus on. Um, an example might be if you see a black person doing something clever, uh, or you know is good at something then um thinking oh that person's very clever as a for a black person sort of thing like noticing that they're clever in a kind of oh um in a, a sort of surprised way they wouldn't be if it had been a white person um and it's it's true that if, if a white person is doing something they don't have to think that they're a credit to their race by being cl uh, clever at it. Uh, whereas a black person um, might be thought of as, well, they are, you know, what a credit they are to their race. Um, or for that matter, a shame to their race if they've done something bad, you know, if a white person does something bad, it's not considered to have anything to do with their race, whereas it might well be if it's a black person. Um, another example might be wondering how a black person is able to buy something expensive, like a good car, for instance, a flashy car, you know, thinking, well, I wonder how they managed to get that sort of thing. And uh, this can now come out as what we now call microaggressions, such as um, asking where black people really come from when they say they come from um, Britain. 
you know, okay, you come from Britain, well, where do you really come from? Uh, and uh, maybe more insidiously than that, um, in, it's been shown that um, when people apply for jobs, they're much less likely to be shortlisted if they have a foreign sounding name. Um, and um, being surprised to see um, who is black when we have previously only heard of them, heard of them from them on the phone or on email or something. You know, the, um, if you if you don't know, you know, say they've got a British name and they're black, and then you see them um, in person, having only heard them on the phone with a perfectly British voice, as it were, um, then being surprised. Um, and all these sorts of things are kind of woven into society, into the culture. It's not because we're basically bad people. It's, it's something that has been structured into society with an enormous amount of history behind it. Um, so that these, these sorts of ways of being and thinking are sort of run between us and in us. And so when I say catching these thoughts, we're not just catching our own thoughts, we're ca catching the thoughts of society. See what I mean? That the, it's not, I'm not saying that if we got rid of every race, racist thought inside every individual, that that would be it. It's more that, that we're structured, it's structured into society. And um, we can know about that by actually going into ourselves. Um, but of course, it means that non-white people are disadvantaged in our society. And it's, it's something that's a kind of running sore in society. It's, um, it contributes to, a very, to a, the divided society we saw with the Brexit vote, for instance, and in America um, also um, with uh, the recent election they've had, how divided America is about race. So it's beholden on us to reveal in, it in ourselves so that we, we can do something to help this, um, this, the structure of this web to, um, to slacken so that, so that the structure of society is not based on racism in the, in the way that it is at the moment. Um, how are we doing for time? <laughs> um, I think that's about as much time as I have. And um, uh, I'll hand over maybe now to um, In Inaya. That's right about the amount of time, is it? Thank you so much, Judy. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And yes, I'll hand over to, to Anaya to present now. Thank you um, for, for inviting me to this. This is a really um, interesting and important conversation. Um, I guess I'll start in some senses similar to um, Judy in, in kind of a bit about my background and, and how I came to end up being part of this conversation about race. And so um, I, I was kind of born and raised in Britain. I came from a kind of British Nigerian household. Um, my, both my parents kind of came to, to, to the UK um, as, as kind of teenagers. And um, I was kind of very much raised in a very proud kind of Nigerian household. And that was really what I was kind of inculcated with from very early on as what is the kind of forefront of my identity. And so it was a kind of ethnic cultural um, national identity kind of combined with um, kind of Britishness. And so that's kind of really what I grew up in and always understood as what was um, the kind of source of who I was and kind of what emanated from me kind of culturally. And so it was very, very interesting because it wasn't actually until I was about in my early teens when I actually realized what kind of blackness meant societally and, and the implications of being kind of racialized as black. And, um, and this, was, this really happened in my first day of a new secondary school. 
So previously I'd gone to an international school where lots of people from lots of different countries. And so it wasn't necessarily organized racially, but it, um, it really kind of catapulted to the forefront of my consciousness when I was about kind of 13, 14 years old. And I essentially on my first day of this new school noticed that the kids were kind of slightly divided along kind of racial lines. And I kind of thought to myself, okay, where, where do I go? Um, and, and I just looked at myself and thought, okay, these kids look like me. I'm gonna go out and hang out with them. And then instantly, you know, I was, I was overwhelmed. You know, I, I, I had a instant kind of kinship, a kind of cultural um, group of people that had shared values and, and kind of shared ideas of kind of what it meant to be black. And there was a lot of pride in that identity. And that was something that I really engrossed myself in um, for several years um, until I kind of real, as I kind of um, awakened in terms of my own individual kind of political consciousness and then started to kind of question what many of those things meant. So for example, a lot of the kind of things that came along with this kind of um, quite structured black identity was what your kind of political views should be, what your kind of music should be. And as I began to question that, it kind of challenged my understanding of why I had to necessarily um, adopt for myself a particular kind of racial identity um, as my own. And then as this kind of questioning continued, I began to kind of study more and more into um, the kind of civil rights movement, the kind of history of kind of race and racism um, in both Britain and in America, and was really, really surprised to actually find out so much more than what I had originally kind of conceived. It wasn't necessarily this kind of innate intrinsic identity um, that, that was existed by virtue of just the color of my skin, but actually upon unraveling the kind of history of, of race, it came to be that this kind of concept that we now regard as kind of eternal and kind of omnipresent. And it was actually something that emerged out of kind of very particular historical circumstances. So when we actually um, look back to the history of race, we understand that very much during that kind of enlightenment period, it was essentially invented in order to kind of make sense of um, the reality of slavery at that time to kind of create a kind of racial taxonomy, um, a hierarchical one to essentially explain away the reality that certain people were being subjugated um, um, in a kind of systemized institutional way. And so that's kind of, so, so that's the kind of, that kind of really, really overwhelmed me at the time, the reality of kind of how racism, um, how, how racism is now understood as something that we should all adopt versus the reality of how racism kind of came to be. And so just putting that aside um, for a little bit, just to respond directly to the question in terms of how do we respond to racism? I really think that this is a really kind of fundamental um, kind of question here. What exactly are we trying to achieve as a society? We've got all of these kinds of people saying many different things. Some people argue for the very kind of interpersonal kind of unconscious bias route. Some people talk about this kind of revolutionary change that we're trying to achieve. What is it exactly that we're trying to achieve? And I would argue from a kind of liberal humanist perspective that what we are trying to achieve, I hope is the kind of er eradication or the kind of ending of racial thinking. And what I mean by that is this idea that race, whether you are white or black, should be the kind of fundamental defining way in which you look at the world, the prism to which you view the world, that the, the, it, it should be something as, as akin to essentially your hair color or your eye color. And so this really, this question of what we're trying to achieve to me is really important because if we actually look at the movements that have actually come to transform the way we actually look at race over about the past hundred years. The ones that really drove home the transformational change that we've actually seen has been from this very liberal humanist position. And that's the kind of position of Martin Luther King, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, which argue that the thread that kind of unites us all as human beings is kind of far stronger and far more robust than any kind of superficial racialized category that society imposes upon us. And I think that that's kind of, to me, what I think that we're kind of often and increasingly missing in this conversation. When we talk about reifying and kind of defining whiteness or reifying and defining blackness, I feel that we're tripping ourselves up into the same mistake of racial thinking and institutionalizing it further by choosing to then adopt these identities that actually put barriers in the way of us understanding us as individuals and as human beings. And that's kind of what I would argue 
that I'm, I'm, I hope to challenge. And then kind of moving away from that. I think the question of progress to me is a really, really important one. Um, because what we've seen now is the question of racism increasingly divorced from kind of questions of kind of power and, and, and it's moved into more of the kind of psychological and kind of interpersonal level. And to me, the very nature of the fact that we now talk primarily about our unconscious bias is actually um, a, a kind of example of how far we've come when racism back in the kind of 60s, really up until the 80s in Britain, was, was, was about real brutal forms of kind of discrimination um, where you know, hundreds of thousands of people would, would march against you know, the national front. And I can thankfully say that that's not the experience that I've kind of grown up in. And I'd say today, when we talk about racism, the reality that the whole of society um, would essentially come to a halt in order to, to just ask the question about what is the nature of racism in society is an example of a society that's very, very um, interested in, and, 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 and in, in a desire to actually deal with the reality of a kind of deep seated grievance um, that, that, that a lot of people hold. But the question it has to be, how do we actually do that? And to me, I don't think that we should be abandoning our liberal principles in that pursuit. And that is one, the kind of belief in equality under the law. I don't think that we should now be treating people differently. Whereas we were arguing against treating people differently, we're increasingly arguing that we should see race, we should judge people by their differences, and we should be treating people differently based off of race. I don't think that. I think that actually the liberal principle of equality under the law uh, must stand. I think the recognition of human complexity is really, really important. That, that's the, the belief that although someone may not experience racism. As human beings, we all have the capacity for empathy and to imagine what it might feel like to be discriminated against, it, what it might feel like to, to be judged by the color of your skin. And that, that kind of common human empathy is really what I believe that we should empathize, empathize because I, regardless of if white people or, or so on may, um, may have privileges, I think that all human beings have the capacity for tribalism. All human beings have the capacity to judge one another and actually recognizing that those, those, those discriminatory pra practices often emanate from behaviors that are all innate within all of us, I think again, helps us to move away from this kind of trap of, of, of racial thinking and recognizing that the kind of real progress, and I think this is really important, as a, as a kind of woman myself, as I said, who's kind of grown up in a society that's made lots of progress. I think having some perspective when we kind of fall into this idea that, that, that we haven't really come a long way. I think we absolutely have and the kind of data and empirical evidence really kind of reflects that. So for example, if we look at many of the indicators, whether that is, for example, in education, now it's a much more complex picture. For example, the, the most likely to go to uni, some of the highest achieving right now are kind of British Afri kids of African descent. And that's a very different picture. For example, kids of, of Caribbean descent or kids from that are, are, are white people on free school meals and recognizing the kind of complexity of that picture um, moves away from this kind of racial thinking and helps us to actually get much deeper into the kind of deep seated reasons why these things are happening. So ultimately, Ultimately, what I'm saying is that I think racism absolutely does exist. And I don't think that that should be diminished. But one, in order to, I think that we have to see the broad range of reasons as to um, what is causing the various disparities and not jump instantly on the kind of lens of racism. I think we have to fundamentally recognize progress and look what we've done in the past that has actually enabled us to progress in the way that we have. And to me, that is the kind of liberal humanist perspective, not the kind of racial identity perspective or the racializing perspective and I also think and I also think that re recognizing and, and, and sticking to those liberal principles um, is how we actually um, move forward in a way that unites us in our common humanity and doesn't trip us up into the, the kind of trap of racial thinking. That's it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anaya. Oh, thank you to both of you. Um, so now we're moving into the to the part of the our webinar where we are asking questions. Uh, so please, if you do have questions for our speakers, you can use the pigeonhole link, or you can just pop your questions straight into the chat box. Um, and in the meantime, 
Um, Judy and Anaya, this is a chance now for you to ask each other a question, maybe based on what you've what you've heard in this in this session so far. Yeah. So does anyone feel uh, a burning question that you'd like to bring now? Well, I had thought of a question, um, which is, um, I wondered what influence, what had influenced you and I to, um, to have the views that you do have, you know, what was the biggest influence on you? You, you talked about your um, family um, being very strongly and very strong Nigerian um, culture. Mm. And, um, and you've moved away from that. And I just wonder, you know, maybe there was a book or a person or an experience or something that led you to, um, yeah. to move slightly from your family's point of view. Yeah, so I'd say that I've now gone back to my family's um, point of view. It was a brief, ah. yeah, it was a brief period of um, being more um, centering a kind of racial identity. Um, and then I kind of have now perhaps reverted back to Oh, right. I sort of yeah. misunderstood that. I sort of thought your <clears throat> your family were... Yeah, so... Had more of that point of view. <clears throat> yeah, no, so it, it, it was in school that that kind of changed. Um, but I'd say that my family, um, my mom really, really influenced me. You know, she was a single parent. Um, she worked three jobs and actually, you know, had a lot of difficult circumstances growing up. And she kind of um, very much... It, it, it helped and each day she would very much wake up with this kind of be belief that you can do anything and overcome any obstacle and and that kind of narrative that helped me to realize very young the power of kind of social narratives and the power of kind of empowering narratives to kind of um influence your capacity or your, your sense of your own agency in the world and i do believe in that and, and seeing that has kind of helped me to think um that i worry about the way in which the kind of capacity of the individual to transcend their circumstances um, and the effect that has on people's sense of possibility um, and, and sense of kind of resentment and alienation towards a society if they believe that, that there is nothing that they can overcome. So that kind of strong kind of female role model very young um, shaped my, my sense of possibility. Right, interesting, yes. <clears throat> so I mean, I, can I just follow that up? <laughs> just to say, um, uh, so I can imagine that for you, um, the idea of a racialized society and putting your energy into that kind of maybe feel holds you back from what you what all you can achieve that you actually well, want to be as who whoever you are in as you know strong and powerful a way as possible. Well, I, I I'd say it has the potential to do that, but I think I've also seen that in other people, um, the sense that the, the very belief, and well, and I do think it's, it's not necessarily a belief that is fully matched with the reality, even the kind of perception and sense that, that um, the kind of society is structured um, against you kind of fosters this sense of kind of resentment and alienation to which people then in some kind of almost self-fulfilling prophecy then respond to the institutions in a way that's kind of hostile. And so it kind of creates this feedback loop where um, the, 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 a narrative in society is, is one of kind of hostility and there's a kind of internal sense and no one's kind of saying actually, you know, why, why don't we uh, re rethink the kind of the, the narratives and ideas that we are kind of inculcating to, to, to newer generations about the way society is and they're also the individual capacity to to orient themselves and to change it um, so I think it's uh, it, it's impacted me but I've also seen it impact other people thank you that's really interesting I guess got one for me <laughs> yeah um I guess uh what do you think uh, kind of do, do you believe that we should work to overcome racial identity because obviously you've talked about um white people needing to think about whiteness um and that they don't necessarily think of themselves as raced but i would argue that isn't that a good thing that we should be striving for for more people to not see themselves as race not necessarily for more people to view themselves as raced well yeah i mean i think race race is <clears throat> is a social construct i don't think there's anything real about race 
Um, uh, but when white people think of themselves as not having a race, uh, they are thinking of other people having a race. That they, they're, um, they're normal and there are these other enraced people around, you know, like bl black people, brown people, um, you know, pe people who are not like them, who don't look like them, have a race, um, or like us, I should say, uh, whereas we don't have a race. And um, uh, so I'm not saying that I think race is real or that there should be such a thing as race. Um, I mean, a society in which there was no race, it, it was completely not an issue and not something that was, had any effect on society at all, um, that it just isn't an issue, uh, would be fantastic. Mm. But yeah, I don't think that white people's sense of normality is something that can just spread out or something. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that my other question would be, um, why, do, why do you feel that um, it, you can speak for white people as a whole? Because like to me, I, I feel, um, I, I don't feel that I'd be able mm. to speak black people as a whole um, and I think, so yeah that's a really interesting question um can I I mean I, I mean, my first response is no of course I can't speak for white people as a whole but maybe I do speak as if I can um I have talked to a lot of white people about this uh I I, I suppose I haven't what I haven't done is talk to a lot of out and out racists you know um People who, um, yeah, people who would say that the you know the white race is the best and all that, get rid of everybody else and um, and other people are inferior. I haven't um, had a lot of conversations with people with that point of view, um, but I have had conversations with white people who do discover racist thoughts more uh, subtle racist thoughts if they focus on it. Um, okay. So yeah, that's the best I can do, but I think it's a good challenge. Of course, I can't talk for everybody. Great, thank you. So we've had a few questions coming up in the chat box. Um, so here's one from Alistair who writes, I would have to agree that racism is not as bad today as in the past, for example, in the 70s, when most people of color experienced overt prejudice and often violence on a daily basis. However, I think we still have some way to go as a society. Uh, for example, David Harewood in his documentary on COVID and uh, BAME Health on Channel 4 last night found that a majority of the doctors who died of COVID were from ethnic minorities. Also, shockingly, that black women were five times more likely to die in childbirth than white ones. And he asks, I wonder how this issue can be addressed and health outcomes improved. And I'll just read the next question below, which is actually on a similar theme. Um, and this is Alistair, a different Alistair who writes, I'm wondering what Anaya thinks about the reporting of the lower take up of the COVID vaccine with some BAME communities and how that should be addressed. So I wonder if I'd just offer that question to both of those questions back to both of you and, and see what, you, what your response to that would be. Um, Whoever would like to pick it up first. Um, um, could you repeat the first question? Please? Yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> so, um, Alistair wrote that he agreed that racism is not as bad today as in the past, for example, in the 1970s. Uh, however, he still feels we have a long way to go as a society. And he mentions the recent David Harewood documentary on Channel 4, which found that a majority of the doctors who died of COVID were from ethnic minorities, and shockingly that Black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white ones. And he asks, how can this issue be addressed and how can health outcomes be improved? Yeah, um, so a few things I'd say to that. Um, the first thing is that when, when we say that there's still much more that we need to do. Although I have, I, 
beliefs about that being true. I also think that we have to be really clear what we mean exactly. So as it stands today, um, ex over expressions of racism um, are highly socially taboo and actually people face significant social penalties for doing that. They could potentially lose their job. Um, so there are real kind of material consequences for people's lives for, for, for expressing racism. Um, and so in terms of a society that, um, I, in terms of the kind of social penalty for racism, um, it's not obvious to me what more uh, can be done beyond just kind of trying to uh, erase people's individual thoughts. I think as long as people don't act upon their um, uh, prejudices to which we all have, then I think that that is very, very, very significant. Um, when it comes to the other element, which is kind of disparities, this is again, kind of what I was alluding to earlier, the, the assumption that when disparities exist, um, that that in and of itself is an example of racism. And I think that that's an assumption that does really need to be challenged. So for example, there are both disparities where white people benefit and there's other disparities where ethnic minorities benefit. So for example, um, the fact that Indian people are significantly overrepresented in, in pharmacy, for example, we wouldn't regard that as an example of, of um, structural discrimination. So actually understanding why various disparities exist without instantly presuming racism is a, a, an important factor. And that kind of moves into the health outcomes one. So, you know, the government has been doing a lot of research into the very real reality of the disproportionate impact COVID-19 has had on ethnic minorities. But again, when we kind of look deeper, there are many different reasons for that. So for example, um, ethnic minority people are more likely to do frontline work, but both at the lower end, but also at the top end. So more likely to be kind of doctors and nurses, but also more likely to be bus drivers and kind of cab drivers. So these are kind of frontline works that make you more exposed. If you're from a South Asian community, you're more likely to live in intergenerational housing, um, which obviously we know that people that are older um, are, are more likely to be have the most adverse impact of COVID. Um, ethnic minorities are also um, more likely to have um, uh, diabetes um, and for different health reasons. So whilst, and also people of lower socioeconomic background are also more likely to be adversely impacted by COVID-19. And if you're an ethnic minority, often coming from countries that have um, uh, poverty or from a developing country, you're often more likely to be in a low socioeconomic um, background when you first come, but that's not the same for your children and grandchildren. And that's another really interesting thing that we're seeing, that ethnic minority people actually have some of the highest upward social mobility than actually um, entrenched, poor, um, deprived white working class communities in the provinces. And so whilst we see these disparities, understanding what causes them is really important for us to figure out and ensure that we have the most appropriate solution to those things. If we just assume racism, when that's not necessarily the solution, then we're perpetuating the same problem. Um, and so whilst I recognize those disparities, um, understanding the causes of them is, is important, um, not just assuming it's a racial one. Yeah, I mean, I could agree with quite a lot of that. Um, um, obviously, racism isn't anything like as bad as it used to be, or it certainly isn't as overt. Um, and um, <coughs> Anaya says, <coughs> so long as it's not overt, it doesn't matter so much. Um, uh, because there are laws against it and um, pe people think what they can think what they like so long as they don't act on it. Um, I think that, uh, that this, there are subtleties to people acting on it know that actually um, that racism comes out in a more subtle way than it did and that's that's one of the reasons that you see the disparities that we see I mean I do agree that there are all kinds of underlying reasons for something like the, the, um, the number of deaths or illness of uh, COVID um, um, that it's it's a very complex picture, but I think a lot of it has to do with um, underlying racist the underlying racist um, systemic situation. Um, why is it that um, we have so many more poor people who are black, for instance, or 
even why so many people work in the health service. It's, uh, it's quite a complex picture. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. I've got another question from Michelle, who this is also a question for both Anaya and Judy. She writes, like Anaya, I feel that sometimes racial thinking puts humans into boxes that can be limiting. But at the same time, like Judy has worked to unmask white privilege, you need to be able to lay, name and label those identities in order to address them. I think this is a really interesting question. Is there a way to integrate these two views? Fascinating question. Uh, do you want me to go first? <laughs> yeah, I mean. uh, so I, I definitely agree about the idea of um, being very clear about kind of what we're talking about in order to, to do other things. Um, but to me, the idea of white privilege, I wouldn't necessarily say is a particularly useful way of understanding the problems. Um, and and the, there's many reasons why I think that. One is, I get what I said earlier about the kind of what I've seen is a re-emergence of a kind of white identity politics, where whilst there's been some who have kind of confess their white privilege for a kind of, uh, in a kind of way in which to be honest about the ways in which they may have structurally benefited or for whatever reason. There's other people that um, have used that same racial, white racial framing as a way to kind of band together in, in a kind of defensive racial identity. And, and, and you can't control the, the reaction against that. The, the, the very existence of a kind of fixed racial identity, I think, is something that actually breeds resentment within people. We can't assume all people are going to assume that, you, you know, you can confess and we're all going to be loving. Some people are, do not see themselves as privileged based off of being white and would and would vehemently oppose that. And, 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 and that's a real perspective that genuinely needs to be engaged with. You know, many people don't see themselves in, and see it as something actually um, offensive to regard themselves as having benefited from, from a kind of racial privilege. So I, I don't think the concept of white privilege is very helpful um, just because one, the kind of um, the, the racial thinking trap, but also um, it's not obvious to me um, exactly how white privilege really manifests itself um, in today's society on a kind of structural level due to so many of the different complexities in the kind of educational economic outcomes that, that, that had, what is that, what, what specific example concretely is there an example of white privilege that can be kind of undisputed? I find, I don't think it's in, is very, very helpful. And so when we're talking about um, naming those things, I, I think that we should name them, but also we should be naming them in a kind of hierarchy, in my view, of all the different things that are actually causing that particular phenomenon. So when we talked about earlier about the health outcomes, well, why have we all jumped on, on the racial one? And that's one of the things that many um, people are really challenging. Why, why have we only looked at it through race? Why haven't we been talking as much about economic um, disparities, the, the way in which class has impacted COVID-19? We haven't heard that anywhere near as much as the racial one. Or as I said earlier, the intergenerational um, element, the way in which different jobs are causing different people to be affected in different ways. I think when we kind of place those things on a hierarchy of actual impact, we'll find that the racial one is actually not the most significant. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm sort of wanting to respond to you, but also the question was asking um, about reconciling the two um, points of view. Um, uh, I think the other, just to respond to what you said in there, um, the, I think other things other than race have been, to, are talked about poverty and health and professions and so on. Um, and these all tend to intersect as well, don't they? So that, um, yeah, it'd be interesting with a, with a greater perspective of time of seeing how these things um, pan out. But I think the, the question of, can we reconcile the idea of naming racial groups and actually trying to do so, not perpetuating uh, race as an idea by doing so. <clears throat> um, 
I suppose that if you think about it in the opposite way, what if we didn't do that? What if we ignored um, race as, a, as an issue? Um, you know, what effect would that have? I mean, <laughs> it's hard to tell because we don't do it. But um, I suppose the thing is that white people have named races and do name races. So uh, is one saying white people shouldn't name races then? But because if they if that does happen, then I think it has to be recognized that white people see themselves as not raced, as kind of normal within that setting. Uh, to me, that's important to recognize. <clears throat> um, this, if I could just um, add to that, actually. Um, so I think there's a there's a really important point um, that was alluded to there, just in terms of the reality of race, and that and that's been a kind of um, constant discussion for hundreds of years. You know, even during the civil rights movement, you had those who recognized or advocated the revolutionary potential of race. You know, others that found it an inconvenience, and other people that wanted to abolish it. So I I, I think that 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 tension um, um, kind of all, all, always exists. But in terms of kind of how do we reconcile well you know clearly both of us are, are attempting to in in whatever way uh, move towards a society to which people um, are not primarily disadvantaged and um, based off of their race and so there's two ways that I would argue we we can move towards that position one is I, I do think we need a much more granular level of analysis I think race race obscures um, the conversation. So, for example, very recently there is in the news um, in, in Pontins this this place who um, was blacklisting people with with Irish um, names in order to prevent um, travellers and um, from actually being able to go to go to the place. And so, those are people that are actually, from our our, our broader perspective, racialized as white, but actually are still experiencing forms of discrimination. And so, what does it mean for a kind of Irish traveller to confess their white privilege whilst experiencing forms of genuine <laughs> discrimination. And so to, to me, I don't, I don't see race as helpful. I, I think a granular analysis where we look at the fact that British Caribbean boys are struggling, but British Nigerian girls are doing really, really well and, and, and looking at actually the, the, the kind of much more nuanced analysis of people's identities, not the kind of broader racialized one, which I think can actually obscure what's really going on. Well, uh, <clears throat> for a start, I think um, Irish travellers um, could regard themselves as not white. I mean, they've always been regarded um, almost as a different race by white people. They've been incredibly badly treated by white people over the decades, centuries. Um, uh, so. I wouldn't see that as an example of white people being disadvantaged. Um, I would see that as part of the whole racialized scene. Um, uh, what was the other thing? <laughs> uh, Shall I bring in another question yes. from the audience? Yes. Um, so we've got a question that's asking, how do you think events from the last year, particularly Black Lives Matter, have affected perspectives on race and racism within the UK today? Well, <clears throat> I think Black Lives Matter has been a big wake up call to people um, because it, you know, is saying that black, black people are saying, our lives matter as much as your lives. And of course, some people pick that up as um, that black people's lives matter more than other people's. Well, of course, they're not saying that. Um, so when people say all lives matter, well, of course, all lives matter. But the point is that black lives matter as much as, as anyone else's lives. And uh, I think a lot of white people have heard that in a way that hasn't been the case before. Um, and black people have felt empowered to, to say something about it. Um, I'm sure you've got a different perspective on that than I have. But, uh, well, 
there's elements of what you say that I agree with. So I do agree that um, the effect has been to kind of catapult to the forefront of the public conversation subjects of race and racism that perhaps otherwise we weren't talking about as much. And so I think that, that that's very true. Um, but according to a, a kind of a, a recent opinion on, opinion on poll, um, 55% of British people in general did believe that the Black Lives Matter protests had increased racial tension. Um, so whether or not you might argue that that tension uh, needed to be increased in order to have these difficult conversations, that the reality was that uh, there's been a greater sense of racial uh, racialization as a result of the protests. Um, but there's been something that has kind of come up um, in, in the chat that I think is a really interesting point, saying, saying that kind of concrete examples of what we can do. So clearly we're here obviously talking about, both, both of us are kind of having our different perspectives on the problem and the nuances, but kind of what specific things can we actually do in order to, to kind of move beyond this moment where we're just talking from kind of perhaps slightly different perspectives. I do think that there are things that we can do. And, and I think Judy might even agree with me on some of them. So we've had this whole idea of the kind of decolonize the curricular movement. Whilst I don't necessarily agree that um, we should kind of re uh, write the past in order to kind of perpetuate a sense of cultural self-loathing, I definitely agree that actually our kind of conception of British history historically has been primarily a very he heroic kind of empire venerating story. And I actually think part of that um, reconciliation is both recognizing um, the, the kind of demonstrations of extraordinary bravery and transformation that Britain, cha Britain championed, but also the, the kind of perpetuation of, of great evils and looking at history in its kind of broader complexity will give us a, a, a much more nuanced reality of the way that you know, how our society came, came to be the way that it is today and, 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 and where it was historically. I, I do think that we would benefit from that. Um, I, I think that in education, a, a much more kind of um, an emphasis on kind of what unites us. I think actually teaching kids to think racially, to see themselves as race, I don't think is actually helpful. A kind of a much stronger kind of civic um, identity, which kind of champions values that transcend our kind of parochialism are some of the kinds of things I think that can be done to actually have a much more unified value system in our society. I also think championing the positive stories, primarily when we hear about ethnic minority people or black people in the media is often talking about, you know, what disadvantage they've experienced, what kind of grievance they've experienced, but there's also an unbounding amount of positive stories of people that have transformed their lives and done amazing things. And I would really love to see for a newer generation, stories that talk about um, the, the capacity of ethnic minorities to actually do incredibly great things as British people, not necessarily just as ethnic minorities. And I think these are the kinds of things that both change the stereotyping and narratives that often come from the top down, but also the sense of participation and citizenship that ethnic minorities can have to really feel part of British society and, and not something in opposition to it. So those are a few examples that I think um, could really make a well, you're right, I absolutely agree with everything you've just said. <laughs> um, and um, I think, you know, we have to make a difference between um, understanding one's culture, knowing about one's culture, for instance. Um, for instance, your family coming from Nigeria, um, there may be something in the Nigerian culture that you want to celebrate. I don't know, <laughs> but um, you know, that, um, uh, that people being aware of their own culture and their old, their, the culture of their forebears um, and being proud of that and understanding it and knowing about it. I think that's an important um, part of identity. Um, you, the, um, and I completely agree that uh, positive stories from everybody about what they can achieve in, within education um, and I think a lot of that is going on in education today. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, it, what you were saying actually reminds me of what I was saying about the psychotherapists that we brought to uh, talk to a psychotherapy organization uh, just about race. And he was saying, look, there's lots of things I can talk about. You know, so I, I can, and I completely agree that we can pigeonhole people um, I don't, I agree that pigeonholing people 
um, is not a good idea and actually leads to more racism or more race centricness, I suppose, um, than, than is, is, um, is good. So, um, yeah, I think we're on the same page there. And I, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we've had a very specific uh, question, which is what can diversity and inclusion managers do? What should they be focusing on? I think Judy can go first. <laughs> <laughs> I expect this is, comes from a diversion and um, uh, an inclusion manager. So. I expect that's what your job is, the person who's asked that question. Um, well, um, what can they do? I think it's very hard to answer that question without actually knowing the particular situation in which you're in. Um, but from my point of view, um, I think it's good for people to people who are white, for instance, to recognize um, ways in which they, um, to recognize their unconscious bias, for instance, if you want to use that phrase. Um, and or to ensure, I mean, things like um, if you're employing people, are you put off by a foreign name? Being aware of that, you know. Um, so to, to have a look at your own practices, is it disadvantaging people on, um, uh, in terms of race? Uh, to really have a look at your own practices um, and see what the effect of them is. Okay, you can have a go. Um, uh, probably a few things. Maybe uh, you may already be doing this, but I think trying not to see the, the malevolent in, in what is the incidental. Oh, and what I mean by that is, um, sometimes I do worry about the kind of whole idea of unconscious bias and, and kind of microaggressions, because although a lot of people, um, you know, do say things that are hurtful and that could, you know, make people upset, um, I do think intention genuinely does matter. And I think that in, in this kind of uh, move to kind of, uh, you know, be very hypersensitive about uh, racial discrepancies and things like that. I think that we can be in danger of assuming bad faith. And actually that could often um, kind of breed kind of mistrust. And, and a specific example is uh, this idea that someone asking me um, where I'm really from. So, so that, that would irritate me. I don't, I, it doesn't happen often. But on top of that, I do understand that m many ethnic minority people ask that question to each other all the time. So if I often see a uh, a person that is, uh, you know, looks got West African, I might say, oh, you know, are you of West African heritage? And I think that that's from a place of curiosity. And I understand that some people might um, not like that, but I also think that some people are genuinely asking it out of curiosity. Now we can be more aware of how, how these things might impact people and perhaps change the way that we say it. But I also think that assuming kind of negative intent or that that is just an example of a kind of underlying racism. I think I, I think it's not necessarily a helpful way of looking at things, or even just the fact of like, oh, you know, you you speak really well. Um, I, if someone said that to me, you know, I I wouldn't instantly assume that they're saying that because of what I look like. I've had many of my working class friends um, say hear, hear that same thing, um, and and it might be because they're kind of they have a working class accent, and people are a bit surprised. So it, this is kind of what I was saying earlier about. I think regardless of race, we all have those capacities to trip up and to make mistakes and to not get things wrong and have cultural mishaps. And so coming from that place of just assuming, not assuming the worst from one another, I think will help us to kind of be much more sympathetic. Um, so yeah, so, so not seeing um, um, the kind of the malevolent intent in, in, in what is essentially perhaps something quite, quite incidental. And I, whilst the whole idea of diversity like is, is really um, important, um, I do think diversity of thought 
it is just as important of, or, as gender or racial diversity. So, so are you comfortable with some with somebody saying, actually, I don't really like this. I, I'm not really comfortable with what you're saying. Like, how, how would you respond to that? Would you perceive that as, you know, racism or something like that? Or, or are you happy to welcome people that might fundamentally oppose the whole idea? And so what expanding our view on diversity is not just something based of identity, but also the way that we think and our cog cognitive abilities and, and um, our perspectives on things. And I think that broadening that conception of diversity would, um, I think would be much more inclusive. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to ask, put in a question of my own, actually. Um, and this one is for both of you. I think, you know, part of the reason why we're having this dialogue is because there's a much bigger conversation happening culturally. And my experience of that conversation is that, you know, most often the, the, the different viewpoints from which you are each speaking actually don't often meet together to have this kind of dialogue. Those conversations often happen inside of echo chambers. Um, that's my experience of it. And I, so I wonder just kind of coming out into this more macro picture of what this conversation really means. I wonder if you can both, if you both, if you think more broadly about what is the movement that you sort of belong to or that you have affiliation with, is there something about your own movement that you would criticize or that you would view as a weakness? Or is there a strength that you see in the, in the opposing movement or the, the viewpoint on the other side that you actually think, actually, they've got quite a good point there? I'd offer I, you know, either one of those, if either one of those <laughs> speak to you, I'd be really curious to hear you speak to that. Shall I have a go? Um, I read something recently about white allies. Um, somebody was, a black person was writing about white allies and saying, following the, um, Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of people were coming forward and saying they wanted to be an ally. And he was questioning it on grounds of um, not, uh, of it being a bit of a flash in the pan, that it's like a, a, the flavor of the month and that those people will disappear. Um, and I think that can happen in, people who think about white privilege. It's, it's kind of a hard thing to keep going with. You know, it's, it's, it's not comfortable. It's quite comfortable to be white, actually. It's quite, you know, it's just normal. It's, you're just people. And it's not comfortable to think um, that there's anything deeper to think of about it. And so I think I would criticize that. Um, and is there a strength in the other side? Well, I mean, when I look at Anaya, I, I, I see someone very creative and energetic and uh, not to be put down or to be outdone or to be, you know, and, um, you know, the, I, I imagine that the, the whole racial discourse is kind of a downer, you know, it's kind of a, I'm, I'm disadvantaged in life. And somebody who wants to assert they're not to be disadvantaged, yeah, I'm not going to be disadvantaged. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> get, get the most out of life. And I applaud that. <laughs> That's so um, I would say that a criticism of people that come from my perspective is, um, and you know, I'm, I'm definitely even in myself working on this. Like I, maybe it might, it might come across as dismissive of racism. And, and I, I really don't want it to come across that way because obviously um, racism is horrendous and it's a real scourge. And so trying to, I think that the people that perhaps come from this perspective need to work on the, the way in which it's communicated in order to genuinely um, be perceived as if we're engaging with 
the reality of racism and, and not just trying to say, well, you know, things have got better or, 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 or that there's lots of other factors. So to, 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 to kind of have that language that sounds more engaging with the question of racism, I would say is a criticism and something that I'm even, I'm thinking about how I do. Um, and then I'd say the strength of the other perspective would be um, that I think that the amount of people um, that really want to do something, um, regardless of if I might criticize what, if it's helpful or not, that the amount of people that really feel like they, they, they really wanna do something, whether that's internal um, or, or, or like, or re reading and all these kinds of things to really like broaden their awareness to me, that spirit of like genuine kind of almost self-sacrifice or genuine kind of um, deep self-reflection um, is something that I think absolutely is beautiful and really needs to be harnessed that there is so many people that that see see something in society and want and want to do something to make it better and I think that's really beautiful thank you both so here's a very big question maybe this will have this be the the last of the audience questions um, and this question uh, is asks, do you see a connection between the structural historical elements of racism and capitalism and our current climate crisis? And if so, how are they connected? And how can we respond to these interconnections? And where that's a very, very big, very big Could question. Could you say it again? Really? Yeah. And this one, it's also in the in the chat box. Um, if you want to, if you want to have a look at it yourself, it goes. Do you see a connection between the structural or historical elements of racism and capitalism and our current climate crisis? And if so, how are they connected and how can we respond to these interconnections? And really that's for whoever feels drawn to, to answer that question. Um. So the, the, the intersection with, of the climate crisis with racism and um, um, capitalism. Um, yeah, I think they are connected. Um, uh, I mean, one thing that comes to my mind is that when um, the uh, Europeans um, colonized uh, other continents, um, they saw the people that lived there as expendable. And actually the people that lived there, are the ones that had the right idea, as it were, they're the ones we need to learn from now, um, who could live in the world in a way that wasn't destroying it. Um, and I guess there's something of that now that we all need to be able to live in a world that's sustainable and that includes not um, oppressing each other or exploiting each other or you know that and that everyone is precious and so is the so uh, is the rest of all the living things on the planet um, so i would see them as completely um connected does that make sense thank you Judy. <laughs> that was beautiful thank you and i do you have a response on that one um i i would say to an extent um insofar as just the reality that history kind of plays a part in in the kind of present day and and obviously um the emergence of kind of capitalism and 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 kind of slavery and, and the kind of industrial revolution, all of those things kind of happened at a very similar time and, and, and particularly during colonialism, exporting that to different parts of the world. Um, so the, the, the history of that is very much tied in with, with, with racism. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that said, I also do believe that each generation to some extent has a reset button. And, 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 and what that means is that most of the historical events that have happened, no one really predicted, you know, decades before. So whether that was the fact that, you know, 
in my mom's generation, she lived under the very real reality that, you know, there was going to be a kind of nuclear war. And, and, and that was as a result of human actions and human beings making those decisions in the, in the time that it was then. And so I, I, I kind of, it's, I'm of the view of emphasizing kind of human agency and how we make history and, and we shape it and things aren't necessarily inevitable. Um, and so whilst history plays a part in shaping our world, us individuals in the present day also play, play a fundamental part in, in how we take that forward. And so what that means is that whilst, you know, that historical reality of how capitalism um, links with, with, with racism, actually in the present day, we can choose to make different decisions, shaping a completely different world. Um, and so I, I would ultimately still bring it back to human agency and our collective agency. Thank you both so much. And thank you to everyone who's shared a question. Um, and I, yeah, now it would just be great to hear from Judy and Anaya, if you do have any reflections on this conversation, how does this conversation land with you? Has it shifted your perceptions in any way? It doesn't have to have, but I'm just curious what you know what the experience of having this conversation has been for you and if you have any reflections to share on it. Well, or if you've learned something from it. I think I've learned something about what it feels like to be um, someone that doesn't want to be pigeonholed by race, you know, but um, yeah, I think, I think more about that, about, um, uh, it's not nice to be pigeonholed by anything really, is it, in any way, <laughs> um, because it's constricting, it means that you can't move out of it, you know, and how you're seen is, you know, you're boxed in by the, by the way people see you. And it's hard to find your way out of that. And um, um, I think that's something I'll think more about as a result of this conversation. Yeah, I guess in some senses, my perhaps is the reverse, which is, it is very interesting. Um, to, to hear Judy's perspective in terms of how, choosing to um, adopt a kind of white identity, um, and 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 that's very interesting because because um, um, because I, I completely know that she, you know Judy's doing that um, in order to try and really um, think about um, what it feels like to be raised and to try and really empathise with that in a very deep way, and and it, for me it is a very interesting way of doing that by kind of actually adopting a white. Um, identity and kind of speaking in those kind of terms. Um, so that's something um, that, that's kind of um, new to me to see see that from a white person's perspective. Um, um, I, I would just say that, you know, I would just think conversations like this are, are so, so important. And I, I, I guess I did believe that before, but having done it even again in, in this situation, um, I most people here, I, I'd assume everyone is here because we all in some senses are trying to feel our way through this same circumstance, which is very difficult and navigating our way through it and like doing it together and asking questions in an open way that's not necessarily a debate format, but like a kind of exploration, I think is the right way of doing it. So it's not this adversarial dynamic, which I think can be really just make you retreat sometimes. So yeah. Agree with that. <laughs> Thank you, Anaya. And I just, I just see this lovely comment that's come up in the chat box from Stephen, Stephen, who says, I'm really encouraged by this discussion and by the various chat threads. It is through open minded, respectful forums of this sort that better understanding will come. Um, and he says, I have felt challenged by things both Judy and Anaya have said today and also by others who've made um, text contributions. And I, I think, 
Yeah, that's a really lovely comment. And I'm sure that speaks for many, you know, many people who are on the call today and certainly for myself as well. Um, and yeah, just one of the things that I've noticed myself feeling struck by and really appreciating is just a quality of warmth that's been present and infusing, you know, all of the conversation um, and including the contribution that's come from the audience as well. And I feel myself just noticing that with a quality of appreciation and relief because this is such an important conversation for all of us to engage with. Um, and it's, it feels um, really powerful to approach it in this collaborative and collegiate um, atmosphere. And I really just have to give a big thank you to you both Judy and Denia for sort of leading the way in modeling how we can do that. <laughs> so huge, huge thank you to both of you. Um, and a thank you to everyone who's contributed questions, who's been chatting in the chat box. Um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, if you've enjoyed this event, um, I'd warmly uh, invite you to visit our website, especially if you're new to us, stethelbergers.org. Do sign up to our newsletter so you can find out about similar events um, that we'll be having in the future. Um, and do consider uh, making a donation, either a one-off donation, or you could become a guardian of St. Ethelburgas um, and benefit from um, all kinds of um, wonderful benefits that you can find out on our website. And I think Nick is going to drop a, a link into the chat box um, about that right now. So a huge, huge thank you to everyone for coming today and especially to Judy and Denia. Um, and I hope to see you again at another St. Ethelburgus event sometime in the future. <laughs>